Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. This is part one of a two-part series with Dr. Peter Hotez, who shares how he combats anti-science movements and how other physicians and medical students can join the fight. Uh, Dr. Hotez is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development in Houston, Texas. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Hotez, you were battling anti-science rhetoric long before the pandemic, but why is it so important to do right now during COVID-19? Well, what we're seeing is uh, a pretty sharp rise uh, in uh, anti-science uh, rhetoric and activities. And it's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? You, are, you would think, right, with COVID-19 sweeping across America and, and Americans wanting a uh, COVID-19 vaccine, that this would be a time when anti-science movements would be in retreat. Uh, but for very uh, odd reasons, uh, we're starting to see it resurface and, uh, and become re-energized. Part of it is coming from uh, a fringe group uh, on the far right, which has been, and they've been going after me for a few years now because I'm a vaccine scientist and a pediatric vaccine scientist. And uh, I have a daughter with autism and intellectual disabilities. And I wrote a book a few years ago uh, called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism. Uh, which debunks one of the central tenets of the anti-vaccine movement, that there's a link between vaccines and autism, and I explain why that's not true and how autism begins in early fetal brain development and the autism genes, and that's made me kind of public enemy number one with the anti-vaccine groups. Now they've uh, given me a new name. I am now the original gangster villain, the OG villain. So you are interviewing the original gangster villain. I hope you know that today. And... Um, but it hasn't, so, uh, but then what's been happening now is the anti-vaccine groups have been aligning with other elements that are protesting against social distancing, they're protesting against masks, they're protesting uh, against any type of contact tracing, all because they claim it's interfering with what they call their health freedom. It's a made up term, but it's a, it's a term that they're uh, throwing about there. And um, it's, it's taken out a menacing tone lately because now you're seeing uh, more aggressive protests and increasingly people are wearing camouflage and holding firearms when they're doing this. So I see the next uh, few weeks and months up to the uh, before the presidential election is a very unstable time uh, with this sort of growing anti-science sentiment. Well, let's talk about how you combat that. Um, you use social media a lot and other venues. What is your uh, approach to correct misinformation, especially with groups like this? Well, I, I don't claim to have all, all the answers, but I wrote a paper in the Public Library of Science a few weeks back looking at this the rise of anti-science. And I think the paper has the title Anti-Science in the 2020s. It's published in PLOS and, and, and Plus Biology. And one of, one of the things that I say is partly this is because there's a vacuum, that we don't have enough uh, scientists, physicians, scientists, and even physicians speaking out against anti-science activities. Uh, and I use an example of the anti-vaccine movement. There, there clearly are some, and we're now starting to see pediatricians be more uh, active and and standing up to uh, anti-vaccine groups. But uh, I, I believe that there's kind of a vacuum there. We don't have sufficient numbers of these docs and of these scientists really speaking out, defending science and explaining science to the public. And part of it is because it's not really in the DNA of medical and scientific education. Uh, most medical students are not trained in how to talk to the public or not, uh, don't receive uh, media training. And this is uh, uh, also true of, of uh, resident physicians and fellows and even junior faculty. And there really isn't that ecosystem in place. Yet the young physicians that I talk to, they're all in. They, they you know, the commitment to public service among medical students and young physicians is at an all-time high. And I think if we help to create that infrastructure, it would really flourish.
it's kind of yet an, another uh, expectation uh, that I think physicians weren't expecting. You know, what else do you owe that kind of vacuum to? And what do you need to do to get more physicians to be more vocal? I, you know, I partly blame uh, the culture of academic health centers. I think in many places, not not at, not at Baylor or Texas Children's, but at some places, the uh, offices of communications don't want their docs speaking out, or they do it in a very uh, guarded way. And and partly it's, you know, they see their role as protecting the institution, not protecting uh, the physician. So they tend to be quite risk averse, and they don't want their physicians and their scientists out there uh, expressing views on social media or writing op-ed pieces. And I, and I think we've got to fix that culture. The other piece we have to fix is, uh, again, at academic health centers, uh, young physicians who are working in academic medicine are, are not incentivized to do public engagement or write for the public or speak for the public. Most uh, annual evaluation forms and uh, and physicians who are coming up for tenure uh, or for promotion within the academic system don't receive any incentives to do that. In fact, there's usually not even a place on their on their self-reporting forms to even include that information. So it really requires fostering a whole environment to to make this happen. Yeah, that's interesting. I had another very, very public uh, physician, Dr. Mike, who has about uh, six million YouTube uh, followers. Uh, when I asked him about his advice, he says, you know, doctors are very comfortable uh, with the data and the science, but they need to be better storytellers. And I think uh, that's what I'm hearing for you, from you as well. Um, you authored an article back in March. Yeah, yeah I think. Yeah. I, I, so let me just say, I think you're absolutely yeah. right. I think that's a nice term that that he that he uses, uh, storytellers and um, and it takes time to learn how to do that. It's not something that uh, comes necess that's necessarily intuitive. It is for a few, but for most, it's not. And you know, over the years of, you know, practice and had the opportunity to be on TV and and that sort of thing. But it's it's a learned craft. It's not something that um, it's not something that's uh, that's always intuitively obvious. Well, when you think about you know your article that you published before about a new generation of more visible scientists and science communicators, you know, kind of what are your guide? What are your guidelines to physicians and medical students about how to play a more active role in correcting misinformation? Well, I think one of the things you you need to do right off the bat is have a conversation with your office of communications and your academic health health center and and get get a sense of what the ground rules are and what's going to get you into trouble. It's it's uh, because the, the, what you don't want uh, is to, to be out there and then find out you've really upset your dean or your or your or uh, or a very important people at the medical center. Give them a heads up and get and get some guidelines and to and to what what are the boundaries of, of, for instance and in in different and it's different being at a state medical school. Uh, where the medical school may depend on an annual appropriation from the state legislature versus a, a, a private school, and it may reflect certain donors, and get educated about that and learn to develop a working relationship with your office of communications. I think that's really important. The other thing I would often advise is, uh, uh, you know, pick your battles. I, I don't try to be a public intellectual about every aspect of biomedical science. I'm, I'm not out there really talking about diabetes and hypertension. I, I try to stay somewhat in my lane of expertise, uh, maybe a little broadly defined in some others might, and you know, really focusing on infectious, parasitic, tropical diseases and, uh, and vaccines. Uh, and, uh, and so for, in my case, I came at it from a subject matter expert Others manage to do it really well by by broad and do it in a, in a broader way. And I'm always listening to them very carefully and trying to learn from them how they do it. You know, I'm referring to individuals like Dr. Peter Attia, for instance, who I really admire. And, you know, he's someone that can feel pretty comfortable um, doing, you know, getting a sort of a crash learning course in a particular area and being able to articulate that. That's tough to do. Uh, that's sort of an aspirational goal. Uh, but uh, for now, 
uh, I'm all about being a subject matter expert in an area and kind of staying in that in that area area, but then also having a social conscious and knowing how to apply your knowledge to dealing with relevant issues of the day. That concludes part one of our discussion with Dr. Peter Hotez. Thank you, Dr. Hotez, for being here today and sharing your perspective. We'll be back tomorrow to continue this important conversation with part two of our series. In the meantime, for updated resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us and take care.